This is Duke University. Welcome to the 11th Lynn W. Day Distinguished Lectureship in Forest and Conservation History sponsored by the Forest History Society, the Duke University Department of History, and the Nicholas School of the Environment. Now first, uh, everyone turn off their cell phones, please. I also want to welcome uh, the Triangle Chapter of the Society of American Foresters. Uh, you're scheduled to have a short business meeting uh, following the reception downstairs in room 105B. Also, I'd like to make everyone aware that the Duke Student Chapter of the SAF has organized a very impressive uh, symposium for tomorrow entitled uh, Family Forests, the Future of America's Forest Heritage. This will be from 8.30 to 3.30 in the Bryan Center, and you can find more information about the program at www.duke.edu slash web slash forestry. The Distinguished Lectureship seeks to recognize a scholar or leader in natural resources that is shaping our understanding of human history and environmental change. In addition to recognizing evolving scholarship, the lectureships aim to be accessible to a broad audience on unique and provocative topics and philosophies. They all consider elements of the moral challenge of living sustainably on the earth. Information about the previous lectures given by noted environmental historians, uh, William Cronin, Stephen Pine, Donald Worcester, Char Miller, Roderick Nash, Patricia Limerick, and among others can be found at the Forest History Society website at www.foresthistory.org. The lectureship was named for Lynn Warehouser Day, a longtime supporter of the Forest History Society. She was committed to forest conservation, environmental issues, human welfare, and international development. She firmly believed that the lessons of history can help us ask better questions, questions that will in turn lead to better decisions now and in the future. The lecture has been approved for one hour of CFE credit by the Society of American Foresters, and it qualifies for one credit towards the North Carolina Environmental Education Certificate Program. If you're interested in the CFE credit hours, make sure you sign the roster and, and pick up a certificate outside the doors. Um, you also find some information about the Forest History Society, and please take a complimentary copy of our magazine, Forest History Today. Following the lecture, you're invited to join us downstairs for a reception in the Hall of Science. Our speaker today is Dr. Nancy Langston, who will be speaking on climate change, boreal forests, and the legacies of history. She will explore the connections between forests, fisheries, toxics, and climate change, focusing on Lake Superior boreal forests. Dr. Langston is a professor in the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a joint appointment in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. Since 2003, she has also held an affiliate appointment with the History Department. As an environmental historian, Dr. Langston has a penchant for exploring topics that relate environmental history to current issues and she does this by taking dead aim at the unintended consequences of our resource decisions. Her first book, Forest Dreams, Forest Nightmares, The Paradox of Old Growth in, Inland West, in the Inland West, published in 1995 by the University of Washington Press, won the Forest History Society's Charles A. Weyerhaeuser Award for Best Book in Forest and Conservation History. Her 2003 book, where Land and Water Meet, a Western Landscape Transformed, examines the Malheur Basin in Oregon and the effects of management interventions, especially following the establishment of a national wildlife refuge. In her most recent effort, Toxic Bodies, Hormone Disruptors and the Legacy of DES, published by the Yale University Press in 2010, she explores why our environment has become saturated with synthetic chemicals that disrupt hormones and asks what we can do to protect human 
and environmental health. Because of her current research on sustaining Lake Superior, she was recently appointed a member of the Binational Forum, the, uh, the citizens group dedicated to protecting and restoring Lake Superior. Dr. Langston earned a Bachelor of Arts in English from Dartmouth College in 1984, a Master's in English from the University of Oxford in 1986, and a PhD in Environmental Studies from the University of Washington in 1994. She arrived at the University of Wisconsin in 1997 as assistant professor, became associate professor in 2001, and full professor in 2007. She has served on the board of directors of the Forest History Society, as president of the American Society for Environmental History, and was recently selected as editor-elect for the journal Environmental History, published by the Forest History Society and the American Society for Environmental History in cooperation with Oxford University Press. She takes over full duties as editor in January, so those students and faculty interested in publishing in environmental history may want to quiz her about what she will be looking for in submissions. It's our honor to have Nancy with us today. Please help me welcome Dr. Nancy Langston. Thanks so much for that very kind introduction. It's a great honor to be here, especially in the company of so many of my predecessors. And I think the Department of History, the Forest History Society, and the Nicholas School of the Environment for their generosity in sponsoring me. So I'm curious, how many of you have been to Lake Superior? Oh good, many of you. I was afraid I would come to North Carolina and talk about a place none of you had been. And you would think, why is she talking? about this very remote, distant place. But it's very remoteness, it's very distance, it's seeming separation from all of us here is part of the story that I want to tell today. Because Lake Superior, as we all know, is a place of extremes. It lies here at the extreme southern border of boreal forest ecosystems. It lies at the border between the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence Forest, and the boreal forest to the north. The boreal forest, as I'm sure many of you know, is one of the world's largest terrestrial ecosystems, and it's also one that's increasingly critical in climate change negotiations. Lake Superior also lies at national borders, at the border between Canada and the United States, two nations that we often think have very similar cultural and political histories which would turn out to have forest histories that differ in profound and often surprising ways. Lake Superior is a place of superlatives. It is the largest lake in the world, we usually say. And then we have to add a little parentheses by surface area, because Lake Baikala, it turns out, is deeper and has more volume. But it's really the largest lake in the world. <laughs> it's also one of the coldest lakes on Earth. It's 40 degrees average temperature, which may not sound that cold, but it's actually really cold. You all know the stories of the gales of November, and Lake Superior never gives up her dead. The other part of this extreme story is it's a place of extraordinary storms. 35 years ago yesterday was, of course, the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald, a sinking which never gave up its dead. It's a place that's incredibly deep. It turns out to have some of the steepest underwater canyons on North America. One canyon lies more than 1,300 feet below the lake's surface, and that's the lowest spot on the North American continent. And what all this means is it's got a lot of water in it. It's the headwaters, in fact, of a Great Lakes basin that contains one-fifth of the world's fresh surface water on the planet, a basin that contains enough water that if it were released, it would drown the lower 40 states, 48 states, under nine and a half feet of water. So that's a lot of water. And people want this water. People outside of the Great Lakes Basin really want this water. They want it because water in most climate change models is going to become even more precious, more valuable. People want it for irrigation. They want it for drinking. They want it for all sorts of development. And as climate changes 
these increasing pressures will only intensify the conflicts over that limited water. So contests over forests, who have access to forests, who gets to cut the forest, have been bitter in the basin's history. But they are going to be nothing more than a gentle prelude to contests over water in a changing future unless we begin to re really reevaluate today what water means and what its connections to forests are in a changing climate. So this talk today will explore, only explore, some of the interconnections in this extraordinary basin between forests, water, and climate. And I'll look in particular at the ways that human history, that human changes to the forests in the past century have affected the watershed and now affect the climate. And one of my key ideas here is that different groups have come to this forest, come to this watershed with very different ideas about what they value and what they need. These different groups have conceptualized the boundaries, the connections between water and land in quite different ways. And those conceptualizations, those perceptions of the connections between water and land have shaped their management decisions and their ways of living in this fragile landscape. So a little history, because this is a history talk. On the American coast of Lake Superior, I think many of us have heard the story of the great cutover era, the great lumber era. Extremely intense logging between 1870 and 1909 led to dramatic changes in forests that were dominated by white pine. White pine wasn't the only tree in these forests. In fact, it wasn't a huge percentage of the forests, but it was the tree that lumbermen wanted. They wanted it because it floated. They wanted it because it was valuable for building. And so between 1870 and 1909, that forest was logged more rapidly than anyone really thought possible. By, 19, by 1898, a federal forester, Roth, estimated that less than 13% of the white pine remained. This was much faster than anybody believed the fairly simple technologies of the day could ever accomplish. And soon after the logging, people realized that the effects on watersheds had been profound and often quite unexpected. Many people believe that if you took those trees down, well, you know, that might be a problem, but surely you could replace that with forests, with a, I'm sorry, surely you could replace that with farms, with abundant farms that could support an American civilization of small agrarian farmers. But instead, what they found was that those farms typically failed quite quickly. It was an extraordinarily difficult place to farm. The ecological and human effects of the rapid logging, followed by the failure of farming, were quite extraordinary. And they particularly had impacts on those boundaries between water and land. Just some of the ways, real quickly, splash dams influenced or eliminated, really, much riparian habitat. Splash dams were a really extraordinary technological advance to help get logs out to railroads and to larger water bodies. But essentially, you put a tiny little dam in a small stream, let the wood pile up behind it, let the water pile up behind it, and then you usually sent a kid in with dynamite, because kids were sort of lower labor costs, and this was a dangerous job. Sent a kid in with dynamite to blow the splash dam, and you got this enormous whoosh that took your logs down to the mill. And when you tell riparian ecologists about this now, they go, wow, that would have really done some amazing things to the riparian structure. In other words, gotten rid of it pretty much entirely. It was like a great Brillo pad cleaning out the creeks. Harvest practices, in particular slash fires, increased erosion, siltation of streams. Tremendous quantities of sawdust were produced by the mills, and that had to be deposited somewhere. And so often, the creeks seemed to be the obvious place, or the harbors in the near shore estuaries. So tremendous quantities of sawdust were deposited, blocking fish passage and eliminating a great deal of spawning habitat. Stream temperatures rose in some of the smaller streams as far as cover was removed, reducing spawning habitat for cold water fish. And the ecological, the fisheries effects, the human effects on this were profound. Many, many of the tribes and many of the Europeans who had come into the region 
depended on fishing, either for subsistence or small-scale commercial fishing. So farming, fishing, and logging had all gone hand in hand to sustain the communities on the South Shore. And there was pretty traumatic collapse. And that kind of collapse, the vision of what had happened to the watersheds from this kind of logging, followed often by very intense fires and erosion, led to a real reshaping of American forestry. After witnessing the effects that had followed logging in the upper Great Lakes region, particularly along Lake Superior, American foresters became convinced that forest cover played an essential role in protecting watershed health and also human community health. After forests, because spring floods seemed to increase, whereas the summer dry up seemed to come much earlier, foresters observed this and argued from it that forest cover was necessary to maintain hydrologic continuity, to keep water levels more constant. So for the sake of water, they argued, forest cover needed to be protected. So the point here is that watching what happened to Lake Superior watersheds, foresters began to have concerns, concerns that motivated the entire growth of American forestry that shaped both public and private forestry in the lower 48 states. But after World War II, things changed. The forest began to recover, for one thing. Timber sales took on a higher priority throughout the Americas. And many foresters began to reverse their positions and declare that cutting trees might actually be good for water. Because trees could consume, of course, and transpire water, the net, of, the net effect of tree cover, they argued, might be to decrease water yield, not increase water yield. Since forested soils, of course, absorb more water than non-forested soils, foresters began to argue after the war that harvests might actually be good for water, protect, for water production. So did logging harm or benefit water? It all depended on which perspective you brought to the question. The answer depended on how people measured water, whether they were looking for water yield or hydrologic continuity, and that depended on what they valued. And this really mattered because the Canadian development of forestry happened right during this change in ideas about watersheds and forests. Canada was not, the Canadian shore on the north part of the lake did not experience the lumber era. It didn't go through that intense cutover period that the United States suffered. The Canadian shore, with the exception, there was a little bit of logging in Sault Ste. Marie, a fair bit of logging in Thunder Bay, but that wasn't in the Boreal Forest, that was more in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Forest. And the entire north shore of Canada's Lake Superior was pretty was remote. It was hard to reach, there wasn't a highway, there was a railroad, but there was very little development until World War II. So during World War II, the Canadian government, the provincial government of Ontario, working with the federal government, decided to promote development, European white development in this boreal forest region. There were a host of associated reasons. They wanted to bring jobs to the area, they wanted to build a pulp industry, there were pulp shortages during the war, and they also wanted to settle a place that they thought in some ways was empty. Of course, it wasn't empty, there were Native Americans, First Nations there, but for the Canadian debates at the time, in many ways, they were invisible. So along the Canadian North Shore and the boreal forest, intensive development of this boreal forest became a key strategy decision during the World War II years. Lake Superior, however, was quite remote, remote from industrial centers, and that seemed, of course, to present a problem at first. Distance to markets for forest products was not something you could solve simply. But that remoteness also seemed to present an opportunity. Remoteness could be solved, they thought, by the Great Lakes themselves. Lake Superior might provide cheap transportation to markets, cheap but sometimes very dangerous. The Edmund Fitzgerald was not the only ship that went down in November gales. That isolation, that remoteness, presented an important opportunity for development because it provided a place where there was abundant water necessary for development and also abundant water necessary for moving the products of that development away. So the tremendous fiber resources of the boreal forests 
particularly the long, thin fibers of black spruce, which make such extraordinary paper for specialized purposes. That and the water and the remoteness seem to come together perfectly during the World War II years. So water was really critical for this development. This is an image of some of the pulp mill towns, all that were built as single factory towns, really single industry towns during the World War II years with infusions of government and industry money. So water was critical. The lake was critical in this kind of development. This is an image from Thunder Bay during the war years. Of course, the water provided transportation. The water was also really important for power. Pulp mills are energy intensive. They require a lot of energy input. And hydropower seemed to be the answer to that. Hydropower to power the mills meant that entire rivers were diverted, actually, from one watershed to another. This is an image where the arrow is, the Long Lake Diversion, the Ogoki Diversion. These rivers had flowed actually into James Bay and then into Hudson's Bay. They were part of dramatically different watersheds. The provincial government funded enormous diversion projects to essentially reroute these great rivers into Lake Superior to power the great hydropower dams near what became Terrace Bay in order to power development and, of course, the pulp mills. At one point, 3.6 million gallons of water a day were diverted into Lake Superior at the site of this one pulp mill alone near Terrace Bay. And that turned out to affect water levels throughout the entire Great Lakes Basin. The water of Lake Superior is important not just for energy and transportation, but also for processing pulp, which is a very water demanding series of processes. But perhaps most important, the water was important for disposing of the effluent. Paper production, especially in the early decades before the 1980s, produced a lot of toxic effluents. Chemists worked very hard on this, trying to understand their effects. But in many ways, Lake Superior, these very large lakes, seemed like a great way to dispose of potentially quite toxic materials. Dilution seemed to be the solution to pollution. This effluent, of course, isn't invisible, but often the, the, the chemicals that weren't visible became the most toxic. But people thought they could simply disappear under the surface of the water. Lake Superior is a really big lake. And you can go back and look at the archival records. And there were lots of discussions of pulp engineers, pulp chemists, trying to understand what would happen to those chemicals. They all thought that if we dilute it in the water of the largest lake in the world, we simply won't have to worry about it. So effluents from, from pulp production included mercury, PCBs, chlorine, dioxins during certain stages of pulp processes, and phenolic acids, which are endocrine disrupting chemicals that actually occur naturally in that situation, but were unnaturally concentrated at the sites of these pulp mills. So for a generation, this seemed to be a really wonderful set of arrangements. The industry partnerships with the government actually produced some extraordinary development along the North Shore. Mill towns were incredibly um, productive places. This is just one town, Terrace Bay, essentially built by the efforts of Kimberly Clark Paper Company. And these towns thrived in many ways. But by the 1980s, some of the human and environmental costs of intensive production began to emerge. So the spruce that drove this pulp production also led to some pretty dramatic changes as logging intensified. First Nations people in Canada were displaced in many ways from the boreal farce near these towns. They did retain certain rights to ceded territories that have become very important today during hydro development, but they lost many of their rights to hunt, to move, to live in what had been boreal farce that they used fairly extensively but not intensively. 
First Nations people did become employed within the pulp mills and some jobs. They certainly became employed in the bush, in logging to a certain extent, but particularly in firefighting. This is a firefighting crew from the Pick River First Nation, a reserve right outside of Marathon, Ontario. And those jobs were certainly appreciated. The jobs were certainly a key part of the developing communities, First Nation communities. But tribal communities in Canada suffered fairly intense poverty, social displacement during the World War II, post-World War II area. And in particular, they began to suffer mercury poisoning. Mercury poisoning from the pulp mills, mercury poisoning from pulp effluents, grassy narrows, many of you may have heard, that's outside of the Lake Superior watershed, one watershed over near Kenora, Ontario, where perfectly legal approved dumping of pulp mill effluents that were high in mercury ended up leading to poisoning that in some cases was as severe as the poisoning in Minamata, Japan. And so the legacies of this exposure are still profound, especially for many of the workers in both the pulp um, plants and as well out in the bush itself. Because often the tribal members were the ones who sprayed the boreal farce with DDT. Many, many people were exposed to spray, but the First Nations communities are particularly concerned about the effects on them. There was also some pretty dramatic changes to wildlife habitat in the boreal forest. Many people, when you drive through the boreal forests of Canada, it's pretty easy to think that not much has been touched. But actually, when you fly over it or look at some of the GIS layers, you can see there actually has been some pretty dramatic fragmentation. And so this is an image here, not from my own research, but an image from, from, from the Ministry of Environment in Ontario. Sorry about that feedback. I'm not quite sure what to do about it, but I guess it's just there. This, the, the orange color right here shows the area that's been fragmented by anthropogenic change, as they say. Much of that lies in the southern boreal forest, and much of it lies in what had been caribou habitat, especially caribou migratory habitat through these forests. And so with that kind of fragmentation, a great deal of wildlife actually, such as moose and to a certain extent deer, do well with that fragmentation, but it's been really problematic for caribou, which are now largely extirpated from their range in the southern boreal forest. Pollution has emerged as a pretty significant concern, both pollution from the pulp mills, as I've described briefly, but also pollution from some of the attempts to manage insect relationships within these forests. I think many of you have probably read DDT. You might remember in one chapter called Rivers of Death, Rachel Carson writes in great detail about the effects of widespread DDT spraying in Canada's boreal forests. And it's worth looking in a little more detail at that chapter. Because she writes about how disturbances, of course, have always been part of boreal forest ecosystem dynamics. These are not stable forests, if any forests are stable, but these certainly are not. Eastern spruce budworm moths lay their eggs during the summer on conifer needles, particularly in the needles of balsam fir and spruce. These caterpillars overwinter, and in the spring they emerge to feed upon the trees, killing the trees if enough budworm are present. So they don't always kill the trees. Large-scale infestations of the boreal forest have occurred historically in cycles of roughly 35 years. The timing and extent of these infestations, however, depends on lots of different things. It depends on the weather in the spring. So caterpillars seem to do particularly well during warm and dry springs. It depends on host populations. So large expanses of mature balsam fir or spruce provide good food sources for an expanding caterpillar population. So these insect cycles are perfectly natural, but after World War II, they began to complicate some of the provincial efforts to fully utilize the boreal forest for pulp production. When the spruce budworm populations exploded in the late 1940s, foresters were armed with new technologies made possible by the war. And that, of course, was DDT. I love this ad. It's just, we, you can't see it in great detail. But in its own way, it's kind of charming. 
But especially the name of the chemical companies have actually gotten kind of better at changing the name of chemicals. But the, the, the key point here is that World War II made new technologies, new pesticide technologies available. DDT was much of the research that went on about DDT happened during the war as part of the war effort, incredibly important effort to actually save the lives of many soldiers. And the US Army was actually very, very cautious, very leery about expanding this into widespread spraying. The Army at first said no when they were asked if they thought it was advisable to take this limited use during the war and expand it into large scale spraying of either agriculture lands or forest lands. But they were actually overruled. And it became, began to be seen as this amazing kind of miracle chemical. And the widespread spraying was made possible by a second wartime technology, and that was the planes. If you're out there with your hands, you spray a lot less. But planes, often planes directly released from military service and pilots who needed a new job, in essence, um, all converged to make DDT spraying seem like a great answer to what it seemed like the problem of spruce budworm in the boreal forest. So, the results turned out to be a little surprising. George Woodwell, a botanist who became very in, important in boreal forest ecology, described some of the effects, actually just a few years after this began to happen. He argued that aerial spraying of DDT did indeed suppress budworm populations, but only temporarily. By killing off some 95% of the spruce budworm in a given stand, DDT spraying, he thought, might actually keep the budworms from killing off all the local spruce and fir, but that could rebound and mean that there was an abundant food source for the few budworms that actually managed to survive each DDT spraying. So budworm epidemics, he turned out, historically had collapsed when they killed off their own food supply. But now that DDT seemed to be prolonging the budworm cycles, leading to more defoliation and ever more spraying of DDT to control the outbreaks. And so he pulled together some data showing the extent of budworm epidemics in the boreal forests of Canada. The infestation of 1910 to 1920 had defoliated about 10 million hectares. The deforestation that began in 1945 and reached its height in 1955, so this is when DDT was first being used heavily, defoliated more than twice the earlier infestation, 25 million hectares. And then the infestation of 68 to 85 defoliated even more, 55 million hectares. So as a comparison, the combined areas of New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, and yes, North Carolina, is nearly 57 million hectares. So that was a big defoliation, in other words. So DDT spraying didn't eventually stop the budworm, but it did actually ignite concerns about the environmental effects of spray campaigns in the boreal forest. In Silent Spring, Carson wrote of the rivers of death created by the DDT spraying, and what she noted was that what many biologists were beginning to talk about, that the effects were not only site-specific, not only local in those particular budworm, but because of the ways that DDT moved through ecosystems, it connected the changes in the forest to changes in the watershed. She wrote about the effects on aquatic invertebrates and how that affected fish populations and bird populations. George Woodwell went on to examine the atmospheric mobility of DDT, and he looked at not just the regional legacies, but the global legacies of DDT spraying. And we're still, in fact, contending now with the historic legacies of this DDT spraying. Canada eventually outlawed in 1985 the use of DDT in forestry, although existing stocks could be used in the northern forests until 1990. So it's been about 20 years since their use, but the metabolites still reside in the bodies of people who ate the fish. And there also, it turns out, much of the DDT appears to have been actually temporarily immobilized. It's made its way to the ice sheets of the Arctic and of the Antarctic, where it remained fairly stable. Whoops, wrong slide. 
but it actually turns out Heidi Geis's work has been looking at its release with climate change melts some of these ice, and the DDT is actually, this legacy of the past is actually being mobilized again into the bodies of marine mammals, into marine birds, and presumably from there into people once again. The historic legacies of pulp mill pollution still haunt local communities. They're faced with toxic burdens in their children, and they're also faced now with some enormous economic burdens of cleanup as well. So this image right here shows what are called AOCs. The world in the binational forum is filled with acronyms, so I'll try and minimize them. AOCs are areas of concern. There's something quite similar to our Superfund sites, and there's a lot of them around the Great Lakes, but the areas of concern on the north shore of Lake Superior actually overlap perfectly with the pulp mills, and each of these are actually pulp mill waste sites. Jackfish Bay is by the big mill at Terrace Bay, the Kimberly Clark Mill. Peninsula Harbor is at the effluent site of the large mill in Marathon, Marathon Pulp. Nipigon and Thunder Bay are also these essentially super fun sites of effluents that became dumped into the harbors. Now people, International Joint Commission and local communities are trying to figure out what do we do with these legacies of the past. So one example, there have been recent black liquor spills. Black liquors is one of the byproducts of paper making. It used to be released directly into the water and then people realized one, it was quite toxic and also that it could actually provide a fuel stock for biofuels. So it's actually become more valuable but black liquor spills have still been a real issue. In Marathon, Ontario, the pulp mill shut down last year, but there have been five spills from this pulp mill, from the shutdown pulp mill, as the community and the former owner of the mill argue about who's actually responsible for decommissioning the toxics. The effluents still get into the water. So there, have, there are even longer term issues in just this one town in Marathon Mill in the area of concern, there are real issues about mercury and PCBs. Mercury was legally dumped or emitted by the paper companies for 23 years. They then cleaned up the process in the 1990s, so there were 22 years following mer mercury was not being emitted, but instead it was being studied. And so one, one message here is that the pulp companies have actually gotten much, much, much better, done tremendous strides in cleaning up current effluents, but they still have to contend with the historic effluents. So in Marathon, 23 years of this chemical being dumped into the water and 22 years of studying what to do about it. And after 22 years, they still have not agreed how best to clean up that. So they finally agreed on capping last week, but now they can't agree on who's going to come up with the $6 million. I was up there over the weekend as part of a binational forum meeting, a hearing where we brought community members and First Nations people together, and person after person pointed out that 23 years of emitting a toxic and 22 years of studying it is not really the best possible ratio. They just want something to happen to clean it up, but there are endless discussions about who is actually going to pay for it? So the global legacies are profound. This is an image from Heidi Geis's work where she's looking at the remobilization of DDT as climate change occurs. So point sources of pollution have indeed been dramatically reduced, but now we face much more difficult to monitor, difficult to understand, difficult to control non-point sources. And climate change may actually be intensifying some of these toxic legacies. Much of the DDT, for example, used in the 1950s and 1960s, we thought was demobilized or, or, or was immobilized, but of course it's being re-released as the climate changes. Other toxic chemicals used in production, such as, for example, toxaphene, that is a chemical that was used actually here in the American South when cotton fields were plowed, it was volatized, end up in Lake Superior and in the bodies of fish. And for a long time, chemists actually thought that might be coming from the pulp mills. Then we discovered it was actually coming from here, from the American South cotton fields but it intensifies, it builds up in the bodies of lake trout and in the bodies of people who eat that lake trout. 
and changing climate, changing water, may actually be changing the amount of that chemical that gets into fish and into human bodies. So I want to talk briefly about some of the ways that climate change is actually affecting Lake Superior and the watershed. Because the great, because the Lake Superior Basin seems to be responding to climate changes as dramatically as almost anywhere on Earth. Just a few numbers here. Since 1980, Lake Superior water is clearly already warming. The water temperatures, however, have been warming at twice the rate of increased air temperatures, which is actually quite a surprising fact, quite a puzzling fact. There's been a great deal of research looking at that, particularly by Jay Austin at University of Minnesota, Duluth, and he's looking at the ways that some of the reasons why water might be warming twice as fast as air and what that might mean for the ecosystems within the lake. One suggestion is certainly ice cover is decreasing. There have been lots of observations in recent years. This is really weather, not long-term climate from 80 to 2005. But you can measure the changes in ice cover. And ice cover, it turns out, has decreased by about 37, by 20% over the past 37 years. And this actually seems to be creating a loop that intensifies the warming of the water because the ice cover actually helps control water temperatures. Diminishing ice cover also changes fish habitat. For whitefish, one of the most important commercial fishes in the lake, has, it turns out, higher reproductive success under ice cover. So with diminished ice cover in the spawning areas, it actually, there are real questions about what that might mean for whitefish populations, for lake trout populations as well. Diminished ice cover means greater amounts of evaporation, and that in turn results in lower water levels. So here's an image of ice cover in a colder winter. Lower water levels, this means warming water temperatures, particularly in the near shore estuaries. And there are lots of questions about what those changing water temperatures might actually mean. It could be good for some fish. It could be good for some food webs. But it could be also really problematic for other fish that are right at the limits right now of their temperature tolerance. There's a lot of concern that lake trout, for example, might actually diminish in the lake, or that they might begin to migrate to areas that are actually much harder to fish. There are more concerns that cold water fish decline may decline for some indirect causes, some interrelated causes. Some of you may recognize this scary beast on the lower right-hand corner. That's the mouth of a sea lamprey. And sea lamprey were one of the key stressors that led to a really problematic crash in lake trout populations after World War II. After World War II, the combined stressors of habitat loss, of overfishing by commercial fisheries, some toxic inputs, but particularly invasive sea lampreys moving into the lake through the St. Lawrence Seaway, almost completely eliminated lake trout from all of the Great Lakes. It was one of the most dramatic fisheries crashes in the world. And there was an extraordinary combined effort by scientists, by tribes, by communities throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s, both to develop a, a, a pesticide, a pesticide that could control sea lamprey without harming other fish, to create physical barriers, to create habitat changes that could actually diminish sea lamprey. And in Lake Superior, the lake trout came back. It's one of the great conservation success stories that speaks to the abilities of these different communities to work across their disciplinary boundaries and actually work together. And it's an amazing success story. This is an image of lake trout, of course. But there's a lot of concern that warming temperatures actually is increasing sea lamprey populations. And that's not something anybody wants to see. There are lots of other associated climate changes. I think all of you may have seen these, but this kind of image to a Wisconsinite is kind of terrifying. It shows sort of migrating climates. And of course, climates aren't going to migrate like that, but it's a visual to sort of say, you say, okay, temperatures might increase. You know, big deal, it's cold in Wisconsin. A lot of people in the winter, especially in November when it's been in the 60s and 70s, people think, wow, increasing temperatures, it doesn't sound so bad. 
But increasing temperatures in the summer may be particularly dramatic. And so what this visual has been used to show is that by 2030 and even more by 2095, there can be some really profound climate shifts that can lead to pretty pronounced ecosystem shifts as well. The north woods of Wisconsin may actually have to shift to something much more like an Arkansas hardwood forest. The summer climate by the end of the century may be much more similar to an Oklahoma or even Louisiana climate today. And when people hear that, they think, you know, Lake Superior, like Louisiana, it's really hard for people to imagine. Changes in precipitation, in particular the timing of precipitation, are emerging as another enormous concern, especially for foresters in the region. The total precipitation, you now these models are complex, they're poorly understood, there's not a lot of agreement, but people are hoping that total precipitation probably won't change that much, but the timing of precipitation, more intense storms, more early season rains, less early snow, so less early insulation, all of these, it turns out, can have effects both on storms, and of course, storms that affect navigation with higher winds, but also effects on fish habitat and the tributaries, changes to stream flows, changes to riparian habitat, and particularly changes to tr trout habitat. So some images of potential shifts in forests with changing climate, particularly models of changing precipitation. Birch forests, this is the North Shore in Minnesota. Birch forests may well be replaced by oak hickory or oak pine. There's a lot of modeling going on right now, trying to predict what these forest changes might be under different management schemes. Because all the current forest management that the states are trying to do are based on history, based on 50 years, typically, of silviculture records. And the, and, and the DNRs, the, the divisions of nat departments of natural resources, know that these historic records are not really accurate predictors of the future. This is David Mladenov's lab work, looking at what if we try different management strategies, what might that mean for forest resilience in the future? And the results are fairly sobering for people. Changes in fire intensity, fire frequency, are quite possible in these southern boreal forests. Changes in insect dynamics, of course, and these climate changes, these forest changes, affect not just the ecological communities, not just the habitat for fish, not just the forest, but they affect the human communities that are tied to these forests and watersheds in lots of complex and profound ways. For the First Nations communities, especially in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence forest, the loss of birch and the loss of wild rice with summer droughts in the estuaries our particular concern, because birch and wild rice are not really enormously economically important anymore, but they're still of really profound cultural importance. They're still really important in helping keep community members on the land rather than leaving for other opportunities. So the kind of community break apart that might happen in human communities because of these ecological changes is of enormous concern to First Nations communities and non-First Nations alike. Community changes on the North Shore of Canada are particularly pronounced right now. I'm not sure if any of you have heard, but a couple years ago there was a lot of dispute about the Kimberly Clark Mill in Terrace Bay. They were logging the boreal forest, the southern boreal forest, and a good fraction of that, the Kimberly Clark Mill, because of the particular fibers of black spruce, they're real, they make really good fibers for wet applications, wet paper applications. What that means, of course, is toilet paper and tissue paper. And a lot of environmentalists get really concerned the virgin boreal forests are being used to wipe our noses. Um, it sounds horrible, but one, the virgin boreal forests are actually fairly young forests. You know, spruce does not live that long, but also these are specialty uses that these black fiber that these black spruce fibers are particularly well uh, aimed for. And even though the pulp mills you know, had brought in a lot of concern about their environmental effects, a lot of pressure to start changing them, two years ago there was enormous disruption when these mills began to shut, one mill after another. Now there's just one mill remaining out of all these mills on the North Shore, the Thunder Bay, the Bowwater Mill. The Buchanan Mill in Terrace Bay just reopened a couple, year, a couple weeks ago with very lower shifts. And what these mill closures mean 
is enormous uncertainty for these communities. These were towns that were developed very rapidly, completely dependent on a single industry, pulp. The community members, all their jobs either came from pulp mill employment directly or else from the associated services that the pulp mill, that, need, that were needed to support the pulp mill. So when Marathon Pulp announced the indefinite shutdown of the mill a year ago, Marathon, the town of Marathon was horrified. They had no idea, one, who was going to clean up the toxics because it's not clear in Canadian law who's actually responsible, but also who was going to continue to build capacity for jobs in the area, who was going to pay for schools, who was going to support First Nations communities. The same thing happened in Terrace Bay when Kimberly Clark pulled out, sold their mill actually to Buchanan Pulp, and then they in turn have pulled out. Red Rock, Ontario, Nipigon, the same things are happening to town after town across the North Shore. And the loss of pulp jobs is actually really complex. You know, I spent a lot of time this summer asking people, why are these mills shutting? What is happening? And the answers are actually pretty complex. Changes in pulp markets as these companies, as the pulp industry becomes globally interconnected. It's no longer as cost effective to run these pulp mills not so much because of increased labor costs. You often hear that, you know, jobs cost more in Canada. But modernization in the mills in the past 15 years has meant there are far fewer jobs to run a mill. It takes far fewer people. So labor costs have become a much smaller proportion. So it's not as hard for Canada to compete with China or, say, with Chile or Brazil. A lot of the reason is partly simply because trees grow faster in the southern hemisphere. I mean, it's simple ecological constraints. There's a lot more solar radiation in these places. But black spruce is still a pretty specialized fiber. You don't get that from eucalyptus. Part of the reason, though, is sort of an interesting unintended consequence of climate change adaptation and mitigation. Ontario has very, very high energy costs. And it turns out energy is really important for running these pulp mills. Several years ago, the province of Ontario made a really bold move, a really important move for climate change mitigation. And it said no new coal plants in the entire province, and all existing coal has to be phased out by 2014, so four years from now. And that was incredibly exciting to many um, people who are concerned about climate change. But it's done two interesting things to the boreal forest and to people that you kind of step back and say, what does this mean for the future of these communities? One, it's meant incredibly intensive hydropower development. Um, these are usually run-of-the-river dams, not major impoundments, but they still have some pretty dramatic changes on fisheries habitat and you know, unknown changes on larger watersheds. And nobody's really studying it right now because that's the wave of the future. That's where energy is coming from. Also, economically, it's meant that power costs in Ontario, energy costs, are very, very high right now. And even if a company produces its own hydropower, it has to put that back into the grid and buy power at the provincial rate. So increased energy costs, in part because of the attempts to work on climate change, have actually been one of the key contributing factors to these mills pulling out. And that has the indirect effects of asking who's going to clean up right now. Decreased prices for pulp have followed the global recession. It's not been the only factor leading to the closing of the pulp mills, but it's been one important factor. Recession means fewer, less paper is being used. Many environmentalists think that's a good thing, and in many ways it probably is a good thing, but these local places have become so interconnected to global markets, to global concerns about climate, that the consequences of these changes are reverberating throughout the community. In Marathon, where we were, there's a lot of interest in trying to create a biofuels plant, trying to do carbon, um, carbon trade-offs, trying to figure out ways to sustain this community by participating in new carbon markets and doing biofuels. But there's so much uncertainty, they can't find people, of course, to invest in the enormous economic investments it would take to make the mill reopen as part of this new world. So these new connections mean that, 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 that the changes are having profound effects on these local communities in ways that are very hard to predict.
There are also intriguing comparisons, not just within US and Canada, but at the other greatest lake in the world. I'm not sure if any of you saw this article. This came out in, I think, Monday's New York Times, earlier this week, about how there's one pulp mill town on the southern end of Lake Baikal, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce the name Baikalsk. Does that sound good? OK, nobody's correcting me. Anyway, this is a town that was built after World War II, you know, created in essence by the government. The idea by the, by the Soviet government was very intense development of what seemed like a remote, empty region with a bunch of trees and a few people. So they poured money into creating this enormous pulp factory on the shores of a really big lake that could handle the effluent, provide the water needed for pulp. The town thrived, a single industry thrived, but didn't invest much in updates at the mill, did not invest much in pollution, new pollution technology. And with these changes in global markets, and of course with the enormous political changes in the Soviet Union, um, the mill shut down two years ago. And there was incredible upheaval in the community. There were uh, demonstrations, there was, I mean, this is a completely mill-dependent community. And finally, Putin decided for a whole host of reasons to reopen the mill quite recently with no pollution controls required to try and lower the costs of production so they could compete on global markets. And there were really heartbreaking interviews with the community residents in the paper, because the community residents know they're drinking this water. They know they have higher rates of environmental illness in their children. But the trade-offs that they're facing are agonizing. And even though Canada and the Soviet Union have radically, or, the, or Russia, have radically different political systems, there's some really striking parallels. A really big lake, a government really trying to promote a single industry town. And now we're trying to deal with the historic legacies of the utilization of this boreal forest. So in the last minute, I want to end on a note of hope. It's kind of a grim story what's happening in Canada. Um, and I actually found out, um, I, you know, as an environmental historian, we sometimes tell some sort of grim stories. And I actually learned that my huge survey class in my, in, that I teach to 250 students is called We're Screwed 101. And <laughs> it turns out, I've talked to my colleagues across Canada and the US, and it turns out all of our big survey classes are called We're Screwed 101. Um, although usually they don't use the polite words, but I won't repeat what they actually called it. And so I've been urging a lot of my colleagues to say, you know what, environmental historians are really good at telling grim stories. You know, nobody wants to have us at their dinner party because we make everybody really really unhappy. Um, so let's tell some hopeful stories. And there are a lot of really hopeful stories of resiliency and recovery, especially in American forestry. And one of them lies right on the shores of Lake Superior. On the south shore of Lake Superior, it was devastating what happened. I mean, the fish got trashed, the land got trashed, the human communities got trashed. And when you go there now, they're trees. I mean, they aren't the exact same trees, details, details. They're different trees than were there 100 years ago. But there are forests. There's some old forests. There's white pine. Nobody thought white pine would come back after the fires, after the blister rust. There are wolves. We, I have a cabin where I do my research on the shores of Lake Superior. And you can turn around and walk into the county forest across the road, and there are wolves denning there. There's eagles, bald eagles, nesting at the edge of my property in the red pine that came back. There are, well, some people say they're wolverines. I think it's an overactive imagination. There's talk in the cafe of mountain lions coming back, which is another vivid imagination. But the critters that are there, the pileated woodpeckers, there's so many wildlife species that have come back because of the recovery of the forest. The toxic waste sites left after World War II are certainly not cleaned up. But since the Clean Water Act, it's a lot cleaner than it was 40 years ago. I mean, it's hard for my students to understand how filthy the nearshore estuaries were before the Clean Water Act. There's been an amazing history of recovery on the south shores of Lake Superior. There are paper companies that are actually surviving in Marquette, in Munising. There are towns that have reinvented themselves. 
often as sort of disaster towns. It's kind of interesting, this whole new genre of disaster tourism. The mining communities, the Keweenaw Peninsula is completely trashed by copper mining. And so they actually have a National Historic Center of a trashed mining community. And it, it attracts enough tourists to be one factor, not the only factor. Michigan Tech is also really important. But they've actually managed to reinvent themselves with tourism, disaster tourism as one small part. The forests that, you know, that were the abandoned farms have become a network of state forests, county forests, paper company forests, and now, of course, Plum Creek golf course development forests. That's another story we won't talk about. But the point here is there has been some recovery. And so one of the questions I want to ask in this new project is, is there anything we can learn from the legacies of the history that doesn't want to make us just cut our throats? I mean, is there, are there any hopeful stories about the recovery that has happened on the South Shore that's not going to uh, tell us what to do on the North Shore, but can offer us some sense of the North, not just as a sentinel of the frightening climate changes that are on their way, but of ways that communities can find resiliency in the face of change? Thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.